Okay, so we're going to do the observer, and we're live on camera, and um, and uh, and then we'll have a few minutes of silence just to uh, settle down. So the observer is um, <clears throat> is a form of self inquiry, and uh, and it's good to. Uh, if you're new to the observer, to just sort of uh, check out the observer on a object, um, and so if I was to hold, uh, let's let's use a pen. So if I hold this pen up in the air, it's an object. Now, for most people, it's a meaningless object or it's a neutral object. It's not a charged object or something that's got a lot of associations or uh, charged history with it. So for most people, uh, if I ask, if I hold this pen up, um, if I say people can nod their heads yes or no, like, is anyone the pen? No, no, no one's the pen. So there, there's a very, very clear detached observation. There, there is no confusion that one is the pen. You'd have to be like a pen addict, you know, to be confused or for it to have so much meaning that you'd be saying something like, well, I think I could be the pen. Actually, there's, there's no difference between me and the pen. I am a pen. So that would be someone who's got a lot of charged associations with a pen or is very addicted to, to pens. That simple little thing of recognising that the pen is not me and the experience of observing or witnessing uh, the pen and also having absolute clarity that an object is not what I am. I cannot be the object that is being observed. The next thing is, <clears throat> I always think one of the, 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 uh, the major um, attachments or associations is to thoughts. Mm. You know, it's probably one of the biggest, uh, of course in Miracles does talk about, you know, uh, uh, all my thoughts are meaningless, but the, the addiction to being hooked into a thought non-stop but thoughts and, and uh, but actually, the thought is going past. Sometimes there's few thoughts. Sometimes there's plenty of thoughts. But you know, like a, a thought is is dis, you know like a thought like the, the the sky is blue, is discrete. It's an object. You know, it passes by, and the next thought might be the grass is green, and the next thought might be whatever it is. So they're obviously something's observing those, which is not because they're passing. They're like passing clouds. So what, so the next thing is, is there an observing of thoughts? What is observing thoughts? Now this has to be a spiritual experience. So is there a witnessing of thoughts? You know, is there a detached observing or a detached witnessing of thoughts? Now this is the thing, when there is, um, if there isn't detached observing, if, if the experience is I am my thoughts, I am this thoughts, that means that there's too much hooking into identification or meanings associated with the field of thoughts. So for myself, you know, it's like when, when there's detached observing of thoughts, it's like the thoughts start to lose their hold and they start to disappear. So is there, is there something that's witnessing thoughts, which is clearly not the thoughts? And if you're in this observing or witnessing of the thoughts, that is in this field of witnessing of thoughts, is this field of witnessing interested in thoughts? If this field of witnessing or observing is still hooking into thoughts, is there an observing or witnessing of this field of observation which has interest in thoughts? So in the observing of the interested observer of thoughts, do thoughts exist? You see, because then we're getting, yeah, on, on or off? No, on, on, on. Yeah, on is yeah. okay, yeah. Um, why is it so much harder to do it with something not tangible like thought as opposed to the object that you are clearly able to see and detach from? Why is it so much harder? Is it because we, don't, we can't see it? No, I wouldn't say that, because it's just, uh, it's enmeshment. Mm. So we're all trained in this uh, collective consciousness to, to think and to put value on thinking. I mean, if you were in, like in a Zen monastery, I don't know, a Zen monastery, or under, and you just had to listen to Buddha under a tree for your whole life, 
uh, you wouldn't have to undo the addiction to thought. You'd, you'd be in a state of, you know, you'd be born, you'd be in a state, uh, you'd be actually, the reinforcement would be that thoughts are useless right from birth. And there would be just pure, eternal, timeless presence. But we're all, you know, in the Western world, unless you're, you know, unless you're your father's Buddha or you're living in a Zen monastery for a little kid, uh, we're all imprinted, especially in the Western world, that, that thinking is king. We worship thinking in the Western world. There may be some cultures and groups and spiritual groups where it's not worshipped. Mm. So we're all heavily like, what do you think about this? Mm. And what's your, res what's your resume? And, uh, oh, you're, you're a more valuable person because you can think better than I can. We have universities in thinking. So it's like we're imprinted right from birth to be thinking and being addicted to our thoughts. So it's like it becomes, I, th I think it's one of the most extreme addictions to being in the thoughts. For myself, in, in my own experience, when I started to experience the witnessing of thoughts, I realized it's, for me, I mean, it's, in truth, there is no duality, but it was like something was hardwired to something like this and was just, you know, just enmeshed in thought after thought. It was like being stuck in, stuck in the head. And then suddenly there was an observing and it suddenly realized if you let go of this vicious, repetitive addiction to being in thought, suddenly there, an, a field of witnessing suddenly opened up and there was like a breath of release that you didn't have to, you had the choice of not being in thoughts all the time. And the more there was this observing, uh, and then the, uh, there was this peace and this presence that emerged. And then it was recognized that actually thinking is actually, um, it's just an addiction. Uh, so that's the reason. It's just a, a very bad addiction, uh, I would say, especially in Western world, in Western world, where thinking and university and reading books and everything is valued. Uh, that it, we, and children are imprinted with that right from birth. That it's a thing. So if you had a, if you're living in the middle of Tibet in a sort of a, a, a Zen monastery, and right from birth, you know, and then you suddenly said like, try and think. You know, they'd find it difficult to think. You know, I want you to get enmeshed in your thoughts. Don't be in the present moment, just be thinking. You're doing it wrong, think, think more. And then, you know, so then they would be like, you know, they would be having, then when they get to like 50 years old and you tell them like, no, you're not your thoughts, they'd have a problem, you see. So that's, it's a pre-enmeshed addiction to thinking. When, you're, when something holds so much meaning and is so addicted to, the loss of separation of detached witnessing starts to happen. And people start to get confused that, no, I am my thinking. And they'll even fight to defend <clears throat> the idea that if they lost their thinking, they'd lose their identity. Or if they lost, if you said to them, you're not your body, you're free, for you are as God <coughs> created you, they would get really, really like go in shock or think, you're, you know, think that well, it was a ludicrous idea to let go of the attachment, the addiction to being heavily identified with the, with the body as an object, you know, which you only get to sp have a spiritual experience when there's witnessing of the body. And then you realize there is something here which is not the body. And, you know, you can have detached observing of the body. Even the body can disappear. The sense of its, uh, of its experience can disappear. But yet there is something more eternal and more intimate and the identification with the body and the thoughts. So it's a great thing. I think, you know, the, the, the Course in Miracles talks about meaning and value being projected onto things, you know, and creating this field of separation. But these are pre-existing uh, addictions, shall we say, or, or, uh, collective, uh, collective addictions for the creation of a collective separ separated um, uh, experience of life, shall we say. And it's probably a funny way of what we call the illusion. That, that, that occurs. So to undo it, to undo, to undo something that you're so enmeshed with is, you know, to contemplate, you know, is there something that's witnessing the thoughts? And that's a spiritual experience. Suddenly you have an aha moment. No, there is a space of watching thoughts. As soon as you have your very first experience that there's a witnesser behind thoughts, it then cracks open, uh, it breaks down the uh, the belief system that I am my thoughts, as soon as you witness that. Because if you've never witnessed that, then you could like, you know, you wouldn't be know, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. You'd be like, the thing with people who are, who are so enmeshed with their thoughts, as soon as you ask them, can you be the witness of your thoughts, they try and think about it. 
let me try and think about being the witnesser of my thought. So they try and visualize it. I'm not asking them to think about being the witnesser of thought because you're still in your thinking, trying to think about being the witnesser of your thoughts. So you can't think about being the witnesser of your thoughts and you can't visualize because visualize, you know, if you think about, if you're still in the plane of thinking, but the witnesser of thinking is prior, is before the plane of thinking. So you have to like let go of the thoughts to be in that which watches thoughts. Um, and uh, so also if you're in your thinking and you're doing the observer for the, for the first time, people try and visualize, because a lot of people are fixated on visualizing and making pictures in their heads. So thinking about the observer or making a picture about the observer is still, all of that is being observed. And it, I, so those are, that's the reason. So be the observing of thoughts. Uh, and then uh, the next one, and if, even if there are pictures, what something is observing, a picture is like an object. If I say to someone, like, try and remember when you were five years old in a nappy, or maybe a bit younger than a nappy, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> unless you've got, like, incontinence problems or something. <laughs> but, um, but when that picture comes up, that picture came up from nowhere and it's suddenly here and then disappears. So what's observing the picture arising in consciousness and going in consciousness? So that is the observer of pictures. So, you know, you can't make a picture of the observer. And a thought is coming and going. But what observes thoughts coming and going? So it can't be another thought, because that, that's just the thought being observed. So you can't go to your thinking to be in the observer. You have to be in the observing, detached observing. When, when there's confusion, when it's difficult, is because there's too much interest in hooking in and there's such a latent enmeshed addiction to just being hardwired to your thinking that it's hard in the beginning to have that space open up uh, and to witness. We're on camera, but if you, you don't mind speaking. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly that. With, uh, um, it has worked for me, that uh, with uh, um, resentments I've mentioned earlier against someone. It's, uh, I've, I've tried doing that and it couldn't work. I, I did the cancellation of thinking and that worked, but I think the the obsessive thinking is so strong. I think what you described just now was hardwired that I couldn't actually do it. No, I totally agree. If you can't do that, then cancel it, pray for a miracle to see them differently, and soften up the ego a bit. And then later on, you can do the observing more easily. So I totally agree. Um, so, okay, so the, the next thing is the body. So, you know, I, I always think the body's quite easy for me. Anyway, it might not be. It depends on the, the level of attachment to the body. But look, I'm, is there an awareness of where your shoulders are and where your legs are? Is there that innate awareness of like width and height? And as soon as you have that, it's like an object, you know, it's like a mug, you know. So remember we did the mug or the pen exercise. Well, if you suddenly realize there's an object here, well, there must be, if there's a limited object, there must be something observing a limited object, which is bigger than the object. So that, that, I find that very, very easy. If there's any sense of body, well, what's witnessing the shape of the body? And then immediately you get this experience that, oh, well, there's a witnesser, of course, that's witnessing the body. One thing I find is quite interesting, this little exercise, if you just hold out your hand like that, or however, so it's not touching against anything, and then you close your eyes, you're aware of your hand, but there's nothing touching it or feeling it. So how are you aware of your hand? What, what is it you're actually aware of, apart from some kind of construction of the location of your hand that's happened in the mind at some point? Because if it's not actually touching anything, feeling anything, moving, then what is there? Yeah. What, what is it that makes you aware that you've actually got that hand? Yeah. Mm. That's absolutely right. And uh, so... Mm. I, these are all belief systems, you know, belief systems I see through my eyes, belief systems I am my body. And as you start to get these spiritual experiences, they start to bust the belief systems and it gets easier and easier to be also location. What is observing location? Can that which, you know, if there's a sense, oh, I'm located in this area of the room, but what's observing or witnessing that? And in, so if you can be in the witnesser of location, does, is the witnessing of location, is it located somewhere? So you, see, you, bu you bust out location, or you bust out the body, you bust out that your, your thoughts, and you start to get these more limitless experiences of consciousness, which is not limited to the body, 
consciousness which is not limited to the thoughts, consciousness which is not limited, also time. Time is like this thing of like, something's like, it's almost like something's tracking time or making time or constructing time. It's like a little mechanism. But that which observes time, is there a witnessing of the sense of time? And in that witnessing of the sense or the tracking or the experience of time, in the witnesser of it, does time exist? As soon as you do that, then you see that, oh, that which does, is not in, see, that which is not interested in something, i.e. the detached observer doesn't actually, the completely detached observer doesn't experience it, it's 100%, you know, so in the witnessing of time, the, the pure witnessing of time, time ceases to exist. In the interested observing of time, time is very subtle. Uh, in the interested observing of thoughts, thoughts are very, innocuous and as you know are vaguely aware, you're vaguely aware of them but in the pure observer uh, which has no interest in whatever it is thoughts or time it, that ceases to exist hence i really love and really uh, made sense to me the course in miracles lesson of uh, it said the word the hush of heaven you know and when i read the hush of heaven i knew exactly what it was talking about because sometimes i'd go i'd come out of oxford street station and I'd be enveloped in this silent peace. And I'd walk through the street, and all these buses are going past, and it would be absolute silence. And a hush of heaven and peace would en enveloped, and there was no noise. And then some days I'd be identified with my thoughts uh, and the stories going on, and I could hear all the noises going on. So it's like, of course, you know, when you're disidentified with noise, noise ceases to exist. It's like the hush of heaven. Even in the most noisy environment, you're still in peace. So, so uh, you'll get that experience yourself. When you're very connected, it'll seem like there's no thoughts, there, there, there's no noise, there's like this beautiful peace and stillness that just goes with you everywhere you go, even though you'd think that it would be, these would be noisy environments. So, so that, what are the things? So we've got time, uh, body, thoughts, uh, images, location. There might be a few others. Uh, you could probably... But uh, anyway, so... Just go to the observer, whatever is coming up, go to the observer, or go to the detached observer, and then do that with everything that's coming up. And if this observing, after you let something go, if you're still feeling limited or like something is still there, then go to the observer of that. And if, even if you're like, you're as limitless as the whole room, but what's observing that, that limitlessness of the whole room? Is that limited by the whole room? So let's do this for five minutes of silence and just see how we can go, if we can go deeper into this place. <laughs> 